Historical fiction is all the rage these days. It's a big part of what made Downton Abbey and its depiction of the aristocracy and their servants during England's Edwardian period so popular. How do screenwriters and authors create these stories and characters? How do they balance the fictional plot against the history of the times? And why are we so enthralled with a story that delves back in time? To find out, we talk to three best-selling authors of the genre. First, Ruta Sepetis, author of Salt to the Sea, the story of a ship, the Wilhelm Gustloff, that was sunk by a Soviet submarine in the Baltic Sea during World War II. Among its passengers were Nazi officers, other military personnel, and civilian refugees being evacuated to Germany as Russian troops advanced. She says she was drawn to the topic because of family ties to the incident, her father's cousin had passage on the ship, and because she likes to bring forth those forgotten incidents of history and the overlooked people who lived through them. Somehow they slip through the cracks, you know, and they all have a story. And, you know, I tell people I write the books, but truly history writes the story. And I'm so drawn to these underrepresented parts of history because they make me question what determines how history is preserved and recalled and why is it that some parts of history penetrate our collective consciousness, but yet others remain hidden. So I am looking for those hidden stories. The story of the Wilhelm Gustloff truly is hidden, despite it being the largest loss of life in naval history about 9,400 dead or missing in 1945, while we all know the story of the more famous Titanic, whose death rolls counted 1,500 in 1912. Sepetis tells the story of courage, friendship, and survival through four fictional characters, a Lithuanian nurse, a young Polish girl, a German sailor, and an East Prussian art thief, whose fates converge as the story progresses. But how does she blend the fiction with the history. It's definitely a challenge, and the way I approach it is I try to interview as many people as I can, and inevitably, I will begin hearing some of the same stories or similar threads over and over. And so I will take those threads from various people and weave them together. I wrap fictional characters around these experiences. And by interviewing, let's say, 25 people to create one character, I'm hoping that I can represent a larger human experience instead of just focusing on, say, the story of one family. Sepetis traveled extensively to the region where survivors and their families lived to conduct these interviews, consulted government agencies, and studied historical and personal documents from the time to depict the people and events as faithfully as possible. It's also important to convey through her fictional characters the terror and the sadness of a story like this. And Sabetti says that she heard heartbreaking stories from survivors like this brother and sister. His mother lost sight of him on the stairs, and when she got up to the top deck, she had her daughter, but she was missing her younger son, and she put her daughter in the last remaining lifeboat, and her daughter was saying, Mama, get in the boat, and she was looking for her son, and the ship went down, and she was standing on deck, you know, looking for her son, and miraculously, he had come up through another stairway and was also put onto a rescue raft, and both he and his sister survived, and they're still alive. Sepetti's story was about a nearly forgotten event, but some historical fiction deals not with true events, but with real places. That's the case with Christina McMorris's novel, The Edge of Lost. It's about a young Irish boy named Shan who lived in poverty in Ireland with his abusive uncle. He eventually makes his way to America and is taken in by an Italian family in New York City in the 1920s. Shan ends up involved in a bank robbery and is sent to the prison on Alcatraz Island. The story of that prison fascinated McMorris, and as she delved into its history, she was surprised to find out about the lives of the non-criminals who lived there. There were 300 civilians that lived on the rock at one time. They were all family of the prison staff. And as I researched it more, there was a documentary I came across called Children of Alcatraz and about these kids that had grown up there 
you some of them claiming to secretly befriended the inmates, even though they were strictly, of course, not supposed to. And that was definitely the nugget of my entire novel. That's where it started, where I thought, oh my gosh, this is a story right here. From there, what I learned about those kids was that it was really, strangely enough, an idyllic childhood. McMorris says she tried to stay faithful to the lives that real people, including the inmates at Alcatraz, would have lived in those days. She also wove in stories of real people whose names you'll recognize to balance the history of the times with the story of her fictional characters. When you find out Machine Gun Kelly was an altar boy, for example, at Alcatraz, about Pretty Boy Floyd, who was the getaway driver for Bonnie and Clyde. When you find out about his escape attempts, you know, crawling down into the caves underneath Alcatraz Island and actually turning himself in eventually, even after they declared him presumed drowned because he just couldn't take the freezing cold and snapping crabs that kept him awake all night. And these are the things that you think, oh my gosh, I've got to incorporate them into the story somehow. So those are fun to include, and yet I think that it is really important. The way that I write my story, anyway, of trying to keep those pages turning and hopefully add enough suspense and questions that make the reader want to rush through is be able to share those pieces of history and yet always making sure that you don't give so much that it doesn't serve the story anymore. Our third guest focused her story not on a historical event or an actual place, but on a real person. Michelle Gable's historical novel, I'll See You in Paris, is the story of the great Edwardian beauty Gladys Deacon an American who became Gladys Spencer Churchill, the Duchess of Marlborough. She says that she came across Gladys when she was doing research for another book and found that the Duchess was a very unusual and eccentric woman for her time. She struck me as so interesting between the paraffin wax Winston Churchill was her husband's best friend and his cousin, and they did not get along. They would harass each other endlessly. She would bring a gun to the dinner table to keep her husband in line. She had all these crazy antics, and she was known to be, in her day, the most beautiful and intelligent woman of her era. So she was not only just very beautiful, but very, very smart, always looking to better herself, trying to learn calculus and physics, and then try to learn more about the art world and theater. And she was just very into wanting to better herself. And when her husband, the Duke, died, he died in the 30s, and she left her palace, Blenheim Palace, and then turned up in the English countryside in the 70s in this dilapidated Grey Garden-style manse, and she's almost 100 years old at this point. The story of Gable's novel revolves around Annie, a modern young American woman who is searching for clues about her real father. In the process, she comes upon the story of the Duchess in an old book. This lets Gable begin to tell Gladys's story, which she found out was full of conflicting stories. The paraffin wax was one of the main conflicts I found, and it was actually one of the things that first interested me in her because I read about how she had, as a pretty young woman in, in her early 20s, she went around all these statues in Italy and measured the distance between eyes, and she wanted to get this perfect profile, and she thought studying these statues would be the way to do it, and then had paraffin wax injected into her, like the bridge of her nose to achieve that. And they say after she did that, it kind of distorted her face, it slid around, especially by the time she was much older, she died at almost 100. But then I read other accounts where that didn't really happen. One thing that was real and that Gable did use in her story was the relationship between Gladys and the Duke's family. It was a contentious one, especially with her husband's cousin, Winston Churchill. I try to be fair to the documentation of the day and, you know, just as much, for example, Gladys much maligns Winston Churchill. She did not like him, but I very much make clear that it was a mutual sort of antagonistic relationship. She poked at him, he poked at her, and, and if you read his biography, he says the same thing. So I try to stay true to what's out there and what's known. Why is it that we're drawn to these types of novels? What is it about historical fiction that captivates us so much? McMorris says that for her, it's learning about an era in history while enjoying a rip-roaring good story. I love reading about that myself as a reader, you know, coming across fantastic nuggets of history and other people's novels, and I feel like I gained something. I want to go talk to someone about it when I finish, and so I think I've tried to convey the same thing as a writer, try to write a book that I would enjoy reading myself. Keeping true to the history of the time is important to McMorris. And she says that she tries to keep from going too far off the path of truth. I try to do justice, really, to history and the fact that keeping in mind that people actually went through all of these things that I write about, whether it be World War II or internment camps. In this case, you know, obviously, it was Alcatraz or the immigrant experience, prohibition and speakeasies, and sometimes including real 
characters from history. So because of that, I really try to do my homework as much as possible, take very few liberties. And I love people being able to walk away from my stories if possible, thinking of it, I often joke, like literary Advil, so that you get the sugar coating of a story on the outside and hopefully don't realize how much history that you're getting inside until you finish the story and look back and think, wow, I really learned a lot. And that's such a gift, I think, for a historical fiction author. Sepeti says that she writes historical fiction rather than just history because it allows her to broaden the experience of an event for the audience and, hopefully, encourage them to delve further into the times. She says that this is why she thinks many people are drawn to the genre. Through writing fiction, I am able to take elements from, let's say, the experience of 50 separate people. And when I weave them together, then I hope I can represent a greater human experience. And when readers are reading the novel, perhaps they will be able to say, oh my goodness, this is my grandmother's story. And suddenly when we find ourselves and our experience in a novel and we relate to a character, the world is less lonely. So that's why I fictionalize it, to represent a broader experience. However, I really hope that my historical fiction is a door, that people read it and they say, oh my gosh, I never heard that there was this ship that sank nine times the size of the Titanic and about this refugee crisis, and that it encourages them and inspires them to pursue the real story, because historical fiction sits on the shoulders of nonfiction, of memoir, of personal testimony, of diaries, and those are the real stories, and those are what really matter and what's important. You can read all about the biggest disaster ever on the high seas in Ruta Sepeti's novel, Salt to the Sea, available now in stores and online at her website at rutasepetis.com. For a mystery wrapped up in the history of Alcatraz and Prohibition-era America, pick up Christina McMorris's The Edge of Lost and visit her site at christinamcmorris.com. You can find Michelle Gable's book, I'll See You in Paris, in stores and on her site at michellegable.com. For more information about all of our guests, log on to our site at viewpointsonline.net. You can find archives of past programs there and on iTunes and Stitcher. I'm Gary Price. If you're one of the nearly 30 million Americans with diabetes that regularly test their blood sugar, you rely on your meter to help you and your healthcare professional detect high and low blood sugar and make therapy and lifestyle adjustments. Now the new OneTouch Vario Flex Meter with ColorSure technology takes the guesswork out of interpreting results. Endocrinologist Dr. Jeremy Pettis explains. Many people with diabetes have difficulty making sense of their blood sugar results. The OneTouch Vario Flex Meter has a simple color range indicator that uses blue, green, and red to instantly tell you when your readings are low, in range, or high. And for patients who want additional insights and information, the meter connects wirelessly with the OneTouch Reveal mobile app on iOS and Android devices. Simple, accurate, and easy to use, the OneTouch Varioflex meter is available now with an estimated price of under $20. One Touch is the brand most recommended by endocrinologists and primary care physicians. To learn more, visit OneTouch.com. A new survey shows a staggering number of family and friends of people with Alzheimer's disease are jeopardizing their own family's health and financial stability. According to the Alzheimer's Association 2016 Alzheimer's Disease Facts and Figures Report, Nearly half of care contributors have to cut back on their own expenses and basic needs, such as food and medical care. Beth Kallmeyer is Vice President of Constituent Services for the Alzheimer's Association. Very few people are prepared for the high cost of dementia-related care. More than one-third of care contributors experience significant lost income due to caregiving demands. For example, they must cut back on their own expenses, including basic necessities like food, transportation, and medical care. Kallmeyer says families need to proactively plan for the financial impact of Alzheimer's and dementia. Planning tips and more about the 2016 Facts and Figures report are available at alz.org.
This summer, distinctive island adventures, Caribbean vibes, and unrivaled natural beauty await you on the island of St. Lucia. This summer, St. Lucia rocks with sizzling deals for travelers, including free hotel nights and savings of up to 50% off room rates. Summer values also include a range of unique island experiences for families and couples alike. And in August, St. Lucia celebrates its rich centuries-long history of cocoa production with decadent deals during Chocolate Heritage Month. Visitors can toast the cocoa bean with inventive chalk tales, chocolate-infused spa treatments, cocoa plantation tours, and island-wide hotel and resort savings up to 50% off. Chef Nina Compton, St. Lucia's culinary ambassador, former Top Chef finalist, and owner of New Orleans' hottest new restaurant, Compare Le Pain, suggests... Some of the great time to try my favorite dish, cocoa braise short ribs, and some island-grown chocolate to celebrate St. Lucia's heritage and Creole culture. So find out why St. Lucia rocks this summer at stlucia.org slash summer rocks. That's stlucia.org slash summer rocks.